This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have my... I've done a lot of interviews from the Friday the 13th franchise, but I have my first from Friday the 13th Part 3, the 3D version, on the phone with me today... We all remember him as as Chuck, or some people call the Tommy Chong look-alike, but uh, he doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> Folks, I have the wonderfully talented comedian, David Katims, on the phone. How do you do, David? Well, I'm doing fine. Welcome, Greg. Great to be here. How's the weather like in Seattle? Oh, you know, we have our routine gloomy uh, June. So uh, we expect an overcast followed by 80% of overcast. Well, we get showers here right now, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ahead of the game is what you're saying. Yeah, you're ahead of the game. You know, it's you must get this a lot, but of course, you know, you get the joke. Uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Three is Chuck. You're the stoner, and you have this kind of a Tommy Chong kind of resemblance. But uh, do you ever get? Uh, you must get people that at conventions that really aren't sure if it's really you, huh? Oh yeah, no, that's uh, these days. Yeah, sure. I don't look anything like that, but I'm a character actor, so I never often look like. Uh, whatever role I played. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it was intentional to go after a Tommy Chong look. We were going to try to uh, rip them, uh, rip off that uh, idea with a male-female, a Cheech and Chong, but they didn't commit to that when it finally came to casting, so uh, uh, the female part. So uh, they abandoned that. Uh, but I actually, uh, you know, I, as you mentioned, I do... Uh, occasionally, not as much as I used to, but I do occasionally do uh, stand-up comedy, and I have done stand-up with Tommy Chung. And I told him, I said, Tommy, you know, before I was a comic, I was an actor, and I, I ripped off your character. And he said, all right, dude, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a, a mistake. Do you have a favorite Cheech and Chong movie? I think probably the original, Up in Smoke, uh, I would guess, yeah. Same here. I think that's a, that's the best one that they've done. I wish they would get back together and do at least one more movie together, especially with the modern times. Well, you know what? Uh, they are together. Uh, they they just came through Seattle uh, as a, a music comedy duo like they used to do. So I don't know if they have any movie plans, but I suspect that time has come and gone for them. But... Uh, uh, but they have uh, they have definitely not abandoned their act. So, did you go see them? No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> you you could uh, try to do the Tommy Chong thing and be a stand-in. We just confuse Cheech Marin. Yeah, <laughs> well, I will say, uh, you, you know, when I did comedy with Tommy Chong, I've never uh, been offered more pot in my life. But <laughs> that show. Wow, that's that's funny. So, um, you're 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 a comedian. What um, got you into comedy was? Did were you doing comedy when you did Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, or did that come later? No, it came later. Um, I I thought I always wanted to do stand up, but I and I knew I could perform it. I just didn't think I could write it, and so I didn't actually do uh, stand up in L. A. when I lived there. But I moved. To Seattle, and I didn't have as much time to do acting, and so I thought, well, I can control my schedule, uh, and gave it a shot, and turned out, oh yeah, I guess I can do the writing, and uh, but I'd done it over ten years, um, but uh, yeah, I wish I had done it when I was uh, an actor in L.A. Well, I was wondering if you would uh, give us a couple of jokes here. I want to hear your routine. No, 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 no. <laughs> It never works well to just take an isolated joke. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> oh, you mean kind of like what Bill Cosby does, huh? No, not a thing like Bill Cosby does. <laughs> well, no, well, like Bill Bill Cosby will start when Bill Cosby. No, I, I know, I know you're, what you mean. It's just, <laughs> you're you're talking about his uh, court deal. <laughs> no, well, you know how. 
So actually, I, yeah, I'd rather have no, no comparisons drawn between me and Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I was getting at, how he tells a, a very long, strung-out story to, before he gets to the uh, punchline. That's what I yeah, was, no. yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I totally get what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not, uh, my style of comedy is not just one-liners, I guess that's the uh, what I would say. So it doesn't tend to work well. And I'm not going to do my whole routine uh, on a podcast. It just wouldn't work as well. So sorry. I'll try to be witty, though. <laughs> okay. D- just curious. Uh, do you have any favorite comedians, but past or present? Oh, I mean, so many. It's crazy. Uh, uh, you know, but just the current comics uh, Louis C.K., Sarah Silverman, Eliza Schlesinger. Um, uh, uh, Jim Gaffigan, uh, yeah, just to name a few. I love Sarah Silverman. I, th- I think she's so sassy, and she's really, really easy on the eyes too. <laughs> her her recent hour uh, is, is just, I think, great. So she's still got it. What about classic comedians? Any favorites? Classic comedians like Steve Martin, or yeah, or, people or, like people like that that are either still alive or have passed on. You know. Well, you know, when I was a kid, Red Skelton, really wonderful, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know, and I, I guess you know, I, when I lived in L.A., I, I saw all the famous comedians before they were famous. So, God, you know, Robin Williams and uh, and. Actually, we'll stop there. Robin Williams, Robin Williams, Robin Williams. Brilliant <laughs> beyond years. Fantastic. I, I was a big fan of Robin Williams. Felt so sad about his passing. Well, that's part of life is death. So, you yeah. know, I think life was a little bit tough on Robin. Uh, you wouldn't think so because of all that was afforded to him. But uh, he, he obviously had some demons. Yeah. Now, um... Friday the 13th, part three, when you got that, uh, was it just a standard audition for you? Like, how did you come apart about getting the part? Well, I had a friend who had auditioned for the producers before me, and um, he at the time had a reoccurring character role on um, uh, the sitcom Happy Days. Okay. And he'd done several shows, and they... They didn't know if they were going to make this a union film or a non-union film. And when a push came to shove, because he was had worked enough in the union, he thought he better not do it. He'd get in trouble with Screen Actors Guild. Um, I had not worked as much. Uh, I was a union member, but I hadn't worked as much, and I was willing to risk it. And he said, well, do you want... he asked the producers, do you want to see some friends of mine? And they said, sure. And so, and at the time, he, we didn't even know we were auditioning for Friday the 13th, by the way. It was it called a different name. Okay. Uh, but uh, so I came in to audition for it, and they liked, uh, they definitely wanted me to uh, do a uh, Tommy Chong uh, accent, and uh, and so, you know, I could do the stoner dialect, <laughs> I guess, well enough for them. Uh, and so then they kept having me come back to read with different actresses to play my girlfriend. And about the third audition, uh, they it was revealed that this was Friday the 13th. And, and then when uh, they decided to uh, cast, before they cast me officially, they said, yeah, you know what, we're, we're going to go union on this. And I said, well, great, I am union. That's terrific news. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got the role. You had you seen uh, parts one and two prior to this? No, you know this will disappoint some of your listeners, I imagine. But I'm not really, I don't follow horror films uh, or go see them as a genre, preferred genre. Um, so I get asked this all the time at horror film conventions: <laughs> what, what do you think of it, your film compared to one or two or fit five or other types of horror film? And you know, it's not that I ignore them. I certainly saw Nightmare on Elm Street and. Um, I've seen Scream, as it you know was years after ours, but uh, and definitely appreciate the artistry in those films. But it's not a genre that I seek out, I guess. Okay. 
Well, of course, you played the uh, the pot smoking uh, Chuck, and we all loved you in that film and those uh, the headbands and the crazy shirts and whatnot. And uh, of course, um, you're of course one of the co-eds that go on this trip to Higgins Haven. Now, I think that looks like a beautiful location there, Higgins Haven. Uh, tell me about the location. Well, it was on a ranch in Saugus, uh, California, which is north of uh, Los Angeles, uh, within driving distance of Los Angeles. And um, and much of it uh, was built just so that they could shoot um, these films there. So the barn you see in our film really is an artificial barn. That The cabin was uh, built to have wide doorways to accommodate uh, camera dolly shots. and uh, uh, But the general locale is much like a lot of California. It, it, the ranch is, uh, you know, it's a beautiful rustic ranch. Uh, uh, hot in the summer, cold in the winter. <laughs> and, uh, um, not not by your standards cold, by the way, but uh, yeah. cold. <laughs> yeah, we get snowstorms, not fun. <laughs> yeah. But um, I heard that the, the house uh, burned down. It did. In fact, a documentary will be coming out later this year, I think, uh, that uh, is both a tribute to uh, Richard Brooker, who played Jason in our film, and uh, also uh, a pretty good detailed history of what happened uh, to that uh, cabin and why, how it came about <laughs> being burned down. So, oh, when's this coming out? Um, you know, go on, go on Facebook and uh, just type in Friday the Thirteenth Part Three documentary, and um, you'll probably uh, be able. I, I forget the name of what they call, <laughs> call okay. it. Okay. Yeah, uh, oh. we don't really know exactly when it's coming out, but I suspect it's this year. Okay, of course that, that that's, the inside though was really cool too. Like everybody remembers stuff that wasn't in the other movies, like the spiral staircase and the hammock and and stuff like that. You don't find in the other movies. Just little tiny details like that that were really nice. Yeah, I mean the set designer was really great, uh, and and that really was all built <laughs> for the film. It wasn't uh, it wasn't like they found a cabin that just was perfect. They they built it. Yeah, and of course Richard Broker playing Jason, the first to don the hockey mask, and it's unfortunate Richard Broker is no longer with us. Passed away a, a few years ago. I I've heard that he was a very very nice man. Uh, a stunt person as well. Um, what was your what what was uh, your memories of him? Well, first of all, his last name's Brooker, not Broker. Uh, so. Oh, Brooker. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but second of all, uh, yeah, Richard was a larger than life uh, individual. He's British. I don't know if anybody. Uh, I'm sure some people know that, but some don't. And uh, uh, and he. Uh, I, 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 you know, besides the film, I, I, I had occasion to uh, see him on um, different horror film conventions, and he's uh, he was a man who liked to drink, <laughs> and uh, that was probably one of the problems with his early demise. I uh, I don't really know how he died. It could have been something more, much more serious, unrelated to drinking, but uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, but he also was a, a pretty bright guy. Uh, he, you know, he got an Emmy uh, for his um, uh, invention of a camera. For, and I don't know much about the invention, but it was something that, that advanced uh, filmmaking for everyone. Uh, and uh, so he was awarded an Emmy for that. But if you can think of Peter O'Toole at, at, as a young man drinking his head off through his career. <laughs> this is kind of how Richard was. So he's a, he's a loud guy, uh, but uh, absolutely warm-hearted. Yeah, and of course, uh, your demise in the film, uh, the, the fuse box. Uh, talk about filming that. Well, wait, what do you mean my demise? What makes you think I died in that film? <laughs> well, I, you were lighting up the room. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it was a little shocky, but you know, I, I suspect there's room for a, a, a resurrection of Chuck somewhere down the franchise list there. Um, <laughs> but maybe that's just my fantasy. Uh, so listen, uh, yeah, my death scene, um, that they spent uh, most of, part of a day on that scene. Uh, again, um, that was uh, didn't seem so big a deal in terms of the. Uh, that stunt work, but they did have a stunt coordinator working with me because when you get thrown or punched in a film, it is the, um, it is the person receiving the punch or being thrown in this case into an electrical outlet <laughs> that has to sell it because in fact they protect their actors and they don't actually punch them or throw them around the room. Uh, so we work on that slowly at first and bringing it faster and faster up to speed. But there was a funny story about it because what happened is that they taped that uh, fuse box that I get thrown into and land with my hand uh, and uh, then sparks fly. And that's pretty much, I think, all you see in the film. <clears throat> but anyway, um, he said, listen, when we when you go to turn and you hit the fuse box just look away from where the fuses are going to be coming the the, sh the uh, sparks are going to be coming but you'll be fine and so then they said okay let's roll roll the camera let's go everybody 20 feet away from this and I said, wait a second <laughs> hold on a second everyone's got to be 20 feet away but i have uh, be safe <laughs> right by here <laughs> and uh uh, but in fact, they were accurate. They did. I did not get hurt during that. So, but it, but it was ironic. I thought a little bit. Like, don't worry, David. We got Tommy Chong on standby, standby to take your place. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was a, it was a great moment. Of course, you had that scene beforehand where. Uh, with the popcorn, <laughs> you're catching the popcorn in your mouth. Great shot of it coming right up into the camera for the 3D effect. Well, and that's clearly what it was for. Uh, yeah, they had designed that pretty well, I thought, and that, that worked out pretty nicely. Was that improvised, or was that in the script, you catching the popcorn in your mouth? Oh, no, no. I mean, they had us playing around with it and got the best shots they could out of it, so we tried all kinds of things, and that was one of the things they kept. Okay. Well, there was an interesting cast of people in this film, of course. Um, Rachel Howard, of course, played your girlfriend, uh, Chili. Now, uh, we don't hear much of her today. Um, I think it was I think it was Peter M. Brackey, who I interviewed from the Crystal Lake Memories book, said that she was not thrilled to be part of the film. Is there anything about that you can confirm? Well, no, I, I would say that I don't know that he knows that she wasn't thrilled. Uh, I know Peter, and uh, <clears throat> what was the case was that she just went on to a professional career where she thought uh, um, being part of, you know, of a uh, horror franchise really didn't fit into what she went on to do. She, she went on to do therapy, and so I don't think she necessarily wanted her uh, patients to, you know, think of her in that way. So I, she just chose not to participate in the conventions or uh, anything, but I don't think she had regrets. I had never heard that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, more than any of us do, that we're ashamed to be at it. <laughs> but <laughs> Actually, I've heard that from more than one source. That uh, really? she, Yeah. Well, but, but well, you may know better than I, but I, I have not stayed in touch with her since the film, so I don't really know, but... Uh, I mean, but that may well be why, is that she didn't see it helping her uh, image in her professional career. Okay. What was she like to work with? Uh, that was Rachel's first acting experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, she was a bit of a kook and uh, and uh, not necessarily comfortable in uh, what she was doing, I think. Uh, she was uh, very... But, but was she friendly? Absolutely. Uh, you know, everybody on the set was pretty much pretty friendly with each other. So, well, she was the brave one. You were you were the you were the coward. She was the brave one that wanted to go into the barn. <laughs> you remember she well, had 
she had that little uh, thing and, thing around her neck. <laughs> yeah, but see, I, I, with good reason. See, I you say I was a coward, but in fact, I did die in the film, so I had reason to be a coward. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that shot where where uh, you know uh, she goes puts her arm around you, goes, "I'll protect you." <laughs> uh, what you may uh, know or may not know, right after that, right as we're entering the barn. Um, my, you'll see me flicking my hand um, because I, uh, she had just passed the joint back to me that we were smoking, walking towards the barn. Okay. And and in fact, what she had done uh, is burn my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, because it was a, a very short cigarette at that point, and so uh, yeah, I was just uh, actually <laughs> flicking kind of flicking my hand to get rid of the burn pain for a second there. But uh, that was not in the script, but we didn't take it out either because it didn't really hurt anything. Well, tell me, about, what was it like, uh, the 3D process? Um, must have been very, very, very long hours doing just that. Well, you know, that was the, one of the great things <laughs> about it for me is because um, they... Uh, yeah, it did take some time to do scenes, and sometimes, like like uh, uh, Jeffrey Rogers and Larry Zerner's juggling scenes uh, took up much of the day, and sometimes we'd go back to them the next day and the next day, and so if they had to get that, like if I was called to the set, but uh, they didn't get to my scenes, okay, then we'll get to my scenes later. That's kind of how it worked. And so I think I worked probably for a week and a half longer than I was planned to just because of 3D process taking longer in certain instances. Do you like working with Steve Miner, the director? Of course, he, of course, did part two prior, prior to this. Yeah, you know, uh, Steve was pleasant enough. I think he was uh, inexperienced uh, during our film, uh, but he went on to become a pretty good director. Uh, he, he did, um, I can't think of the name of the uh, show, The Wonder Years. He okay. went on to direct uh, many of them, and uh, they were really wonderful and poignant. So he learned something. In, in, <laughs> and when, when we worked together, you know, my character was to a degree supposed to be comedic relief. I had ideas that I thought would work uh, even better, stronger, uh, but, um, uh, but I would do something, and he would say, sometimes he would do this, he would just say, okay, do it different. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's a director, so I'm just looking for direction from him. Do you have an idea what, what you're looking for, Steve? That might help me get get it to you. But, you know, I, I have improv background, so I just would try it a different way and try it a different way. And he'd go, okay, yeah, let's go with that. That's good. But that's not direction. That's that's just, you know, having the actor, uh, you know, help you in the scene because he doesn't have any ideas. So. Uh, you know, so some of my experience was, yeah, I could have used a, a, a better director. On the other hand, he was very nice to me. I actually went on after the film, uh, went on to play tennis with Steve for a few years. So um, nice guy. Yeah, a lot of people mention the 3D, like the eye popping scene and, and various stuff like that. But any time, I've never seen it in 3D. And I remember saying this to Peter Brackey, because uh, he's seen it in 3D, and I, I would say, um, well, people mention all these special effects in 3D, but I said, the one thing I would want to see in 3D is that absolutely gorgeous Tracy Savage. I th I've, I've had a little thing for her ever since I first saw that film. I think she is beautiful. Of course, she played Debbie. <laughs> Yet, yeah, what was she like? Well, De uh, Tracy Savage um, is still a friend, actually, and um, uh, she, her mom was my agent, so we knew each other before the film, and um, uh, so, you know, yeah, the, Tracy had done a lot of work, actually, as a kid before ever getting to that part of that film, so she was very experienced and uh, very pleasant, and because I already knew her, it was nice to have her on set. You know, it's really weird. I pointed this out to others as well. Her character is announced as pregnant. And, of course, she yeah. meets that demise in the uh, 
in the hammock. In a, I almost wonder if the writers had forgotten that she was pregnant because you look at anything that lists a body count, it's kind of like, no, we won't list that. that. That's like, you know, you still killed the fetus, you know, we <laughs> chase and kill her, but they never list that extra one. That's like they forgot. <laughs> well, I, I am convinced that there were many inaccuracies with the writing on this. <laughs> it was not the best writing, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, that was something that we all thought was really bizarre. Uh, you know, she, she uh, definitely went on to do other things that pregnant women shouldn't be doing. And so, so it, it didn't make sense. It could. It didn't advance the film in any way whatsoever. No. Nope. And uh, and it's clearly they could have taken that line out, and nobody would have been uh, noticed. <laughs> so yeah, that was weird. I would have made Tracy the heroine. She just uh, she just had this confidence about her. I I I I would have made her the heroine. I think, and I think she's like a favorite to a lot of people in that film, including myself. Yeah, but let's not denigrate Dana Kimmel. She was pretty good, too. So. Oh, I'm not yeah. going to do that, no. But <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because back in May, I, interdu- I interviewed um, Mike Guttridge, who, of course, directed Tracy in the Bone Garden. And that, of course, had Paul Kraka in it. It had Ron Milky from the original Friday the 13th. And I remember uh, Mike was asking me um, how I come to, to reach him. And I said, that's a funny story. I said, because uh, I was originally trying to track down Tracy Savage for my show, for an interview, and uh, I came across the Bone Garden, and when I saw her name and Paul Kratka and Ron Milkia, I thought it was a joke. I was like, is somebody just making up fan fiction here and just throwing their names in here? And I've come to discover the Bone Garden was a real film, and uh, Mike Guttridge was a wonderful interview, and... Uh, and uh, we talked about that movie, and uh, he was very nice because he s- sent me a copy of. Uh, actually, I ordered it because you know wanted him to get his uh, money for it. But I ordered a copy of his film, The Bone Garden, from him. And being a nice guy, he is. He he sent me a signed photo of Tracy Savage, which I was quite happy to get. <laughs> well, she's a you know she's a newscaster um, in L.A. So. She d- does do a little bit of acting, uh, but she's been employed as a newscaster for many years, over 25 years, I'm guessing. D- d- did you see The Bone Garden? No, I didn't. I, I was aware of it. I thought she did a great job. It was nice to see Tracy and uh, Paul Kraka still in great shape for for his age. He's got abs. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was a nice film, and um, I actually heard from Mike Guttridge last night. He's always putting stuff on his Facebook about uh, movies and whatnot, and I'm making comments. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, nice to see Tracy in it, and she still looks good today. So, uh and, of course, Jeffrey Rogers playing uh, her boyfriend, Andy, in the film. That whole handstand thing was pretty impressive to see. Yeah, I mean, he could do it. Uh, he, he was, uh, he was uh, quite, uh, quite the acrobat. <laughs> yeah, and, of course, that led to, again, somewhat another one. There's little things in part three you don't see in any of the other films, but it's a little something in there that kind of makes it stand out. And, of course, he meets that uh, classic demise with the machete as well. Um, what were your memories of Jeffrey? You know, uh, I mean, we all, on the set, we all hung with each other, so uh, Jeffrey was a nice, I, I hate to keep using the word nice guy, but he was. And, uh, he was very, uh, you know, uh, upbeat all the time, so uh, that's my memory of him. I, I really didn't stay in touch with Jeffrey after the film, so I don't really even know what he's up to or anything, but... And of course, Dana Kim, Dana Kimmel playing the heroine of the film, and uh, I see some videos here and there of her at the conventions and whatnot, you know. And uh, and of course, uh, she had uh, she of course she's a survivor of the film, but uh, probably spending time in padded walls after part three, <laughs> her character uh, Chris, <laughs> um, but. Uh, Dana Kimmel, she did play a terrific heroine in the film. 
And uh, what was your memories working with her? Well, Dana's a sweetheart. Uh, she, um, I think she would say her biggest uh, role was she, she's very proud to be a mother and, uh, and I think even now a grandmother, I could be wrong, but um, <laughs> so, uh, but one of the things that, that I remember is, and I've told this to many people who've interviewed me, but uh, um, the thing is that uh, uh, Dana, I believe was Mormon and um, Mormons, don't really believe in gambling, but this crew and cast uh, on this set gambled every day, <laughs> every lunch hour, <laughs> and she definitely participated because she loved it. So uh, I thought that that was ironic. That made uh, her, to me, more likable, that she was willing to be real. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but she's a sweetheart. I mean, she really is. And and Tracy, too. I mean, and really all the women uh, on the so it were pretty pretty nice. Paul cracked though, um, as I said in the bone bone garden footage of him, he was lifting weights, and I was like, "Holy cow, the guy's got abs!" Like, I'm gonna be 45 next month, and I don't have abs at all. But I don't know how old he is, but uh, he's he keeps himself in terrific shape. And of course, you see him in the film hauling the hay, and at one point hauling um, Dana Kimmel up on that thing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's the magic of uh, movie making. It's all fake. He's a big, uh, overweight guy, and they, they just put these abs on him. And uh, God, I'm I'm happy that they, it made him look good because he <laughs> he suffers from being extremely overweight. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, I kid, I kid. It's not true. Oh, I, I was half tempted to say to Mike Guthridge, I said, how much CGI did you use to make his abs? Is that where the budget went? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, very much a health nut from what I've been told. And of course... Well, uh, well Paul's, a, Paul's a chiropractor. Yeah, I heard he that, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course, Larry Zerner playing Shelley, the original owner of the mask, and... Uh, I gotta wonder every time you're in the washroom and things start shaking, do you have do you still blame him today? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know who who is this Larry Zerner you speak of. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Larry is the one I stay in touch with the most. So, uh, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Larry. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he did. He bought the uh, he brought the hockey mask to the the franchise and not just the franchise i mean that hockey mask became iconic uh you know for uh um horror monsters everywhere so uh, that was uh yeah pretty impressive but larry's a very bright guy yeah uh, and he's an attorney uh, entertainment attorney by trade these days uh but um he uh he was discovered. <laughs> he was just uh, exiting a movie theater uh, near UCLA, and they saw him, uh, the producers, and they went up to him and said, can we talk to you about being in a film? <laughs> he was uh, you know, trying to do a little acting, but he really, I don't think, had any credits at that point. And, uh, the only person I've really known that's been discovered that way. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, Catherine Parks again, another nice-looking uh, female in the cast, playing Vera, who's of course set up with Shelley, and she's less than enthused about it. And had that great shot where, of course, the the uh, uh, J the Jason shoots that what is that that dart or whatever, and he gets her in the eye and. It's a harpoon. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I'm trying to think of the words, and I, I didn't have that on. I knew the word, and yeah, it was on my tongue. And yeah, it's a harpoon, harpoon gun. Ka I've, I've interviewed Catherine Mary Stewart on here before, and she worked with uh, Catherine uh, uh, Parks on uh, on uh, Weekend at Bernie's, and she said that she was her favorite because, <laughs> of course, she played the, the girl that was intoxicated who, of course— uh, had sex with Bernie and said it was so great, not realizing who Bernie was. <laughs> but well, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catherine is an absolute sweetheart, um, and um, I, last time I knew she was living in Florida, but I really don't know where she is these days. 
You know what? One of the things I liked in part three was that little subplot where Shelley and Vera went to the convenience store. And it was just, you know, totally away from the slasher stuff. It just really heightened their characters. And they went to the convenience store and you got the three bikers, uh, um, Nick Savage, uh, Kevin O'Brien, and unfortunately the late uh, Gloria Charles, God rest her soul. We unfortunately just lost her. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and um, I love that scene, just that little moment at the convenience store where it just uh, it heightens Shelley's character quite a lot. And I'm, I'm glad they included that in. Of course, the bikers just become three more people for Jason to kill, but it was still a nice little moment, you know? Yeah, no, it was. Um, uh, I loved watching Gloria Charles in, this, in the film. She was... <laughs> Uh, like uh, no other character in the film, so uh, that was a fun little uh, addition, additional characters to add to the fray. I heard in person she was a real sweetheart too. Uh, yeah, as I said, you know, everybody was, a, and this is generally true uh, in acting. If you're in a film, it means you're working, you're happy <laughs> that you're working. So uh, that was uh, definitely a good thing. Uh, but yeah, she was. I, I, she wasn't on the set real long, but yeah, she was fun to to work with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't. Ha- yeah, I didn't have any scenes with her myself, but um, but so. And of course, that uh, um, opening scene. I know you weren't part of it, but that was again a nice little section at the store with uh, Steve Suskins and Cherry Moskins. And um, again, a, a nice different little location there at the little store and their little uh, husband and wife spat was a nice little comical addition to the film. Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 I what's his name? Uh, Steve? Is that his name? Steve yeah. Suskin, unfortunately, also gone as well. Yeah, but no, really, really good actor, I think. Uh, and because uh, I saw him in other things after our film as well. And so. Yeah, and, of, and and also that shot, that shot when we first get introduced to him, that's done with a very uh, special piece of equipment called a Luma crane, okay. which is a collapsible tube at the end of which is a camera, not one that a cameraman can sit behind. It's on this tube, but the cameraman uh, directs the how much that tube is extended or collapsed uh, and uh, then of course the direction and the zooming in and zooming out of the camera is all done from uh, another another area but uh, very it allowed for you to be inside a their their cabin or the house and then it pulls out and you see the whole cabin and, and it's all done with one shot and that was uh, that was impressive yeah and, of course, one last person to speak of in the film, David Wiley, of course, replacing Crazy Ralph, playing, of course, Abel, who has that eyeball, and you say, he looks just like my grandpa. <laughs> yeah, well, not my favorite scene, just because I don't like looking at eyeballs. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he points that thing right at the camera. <laughs> you guys were warned. <laughs> you didn't listen. Well, I would have, but uh, the script didn't allow me to listen. (laughs) What was the hardest thing about shooting this movie? You know, uh, shooting a film uh, can be boring at times. So it's it's the constant waiting around. You you line up a shot, you're in good shape, uh, you think you're ready to roll, and then the sound guy is not hearing or, or a plane flies overhead. So then you got, okay, hold on. And then you got to set it all up again. So there's a lot of waiting around in filmmaking. Did you attend the, the premiere uh, whenever, whenever it was released? Uh, you know, we, we did a couple different things. We did a sh- um, screening for the cast and crew. Um, I, I don't know if the other actors this happened but uh i was flown up to uh, seattle before i ever lived here and uh i did a uh, screening at a theater in spokane and uh, signed autographs after that but also did a radio show in seattle okay so 
um, that was all fun and new to me. I had never been asked to do uh, promotions or anything, so that was uh, great fun. And so uh, in terms of L.A., I, I have gone to a screening of, years later uh, of the um, uh, the – what am I want to say? Uh, at, 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 at the, what is it called? Man's Chinese Theater, where they did re-show it in 3D, uh, but okay. that was years later. Uh, what would you say was the most impressive 3D shot? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess it's very getting uh, the harpoon in the eyeball, really. I mean, that was a pretty <laughs> amazing shot. Uh but, uh, uh, you know, the thing is, 3D had not been done for years before mm-hmm. our film. So that was the real thing. It was just uh, exciting, I think, for the public to see that. And just a month after our film, um, Jaws 3D came out. So Yeah, uh, and Amityville 3D. Yeah, so we they copied us. All of them copied us. Yeah, and and I heard they didn't do it as well as Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. I mean, your film uh, is, uh, despite all a lot of negative reviews, a lot of people say that the three D was uh, spot on perfect. Well, the three D equipment they used was pretty impressive. I, I will say this: I I only I don't hold much water with reviews um, because. Uh, you know, I thought Friday the 13th was not really a well-written film. <laughs> and uh, and when it came out that same weekend, there was a movie with Su- Susan Sarandon and uh, John Cassavetes called, and uh, Raul Julia called Tempest. Okay. It was a genius film. <laughs> and they gave both our film and that film a five. <laughs> our film didn't probably even deserve a five and uh, their film probably deserved a nine or, or so. So, you know, reviewers, who knows what they're thinking? They're in their own world. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what do you think after all these years, uh, the, you know, Friday the 13th part three, still, uh, holding up in 3d and still getting played and still people enjoy it. Uh, and you being at the conventions, what do you, what do you think all these years later? I, I would think that if you asked any one of us in any one of these films, uh, did you expect it to hold hold the uh, interest as long as it has? <laughs> they would all say, no, had no idea it would, it would be this successful. Um, so I still get uh about every other week or every month, I get uh, fan mail from really all over the world, and it just it shocks me. <laughs> I'm happy, but it shocks me. <laughs> when you go to these conventions, as uh, and I, I, I always ask this to people that do conventions, uh, what's the most uh, unique or interesting thing you've been asked to sign? Well, you know, I don't do a lot of conventions. The Jasons do a lot of them. Uh, different actors that play Jason, but uh, I don't do a lot of them. So uh, w- what was surprising to me is when I went to my first one, I, you know, I came with uh, photos to have people sign uh, or to sign for people and, and was learned that, uh, yeah, some people will want those, but uh, a lot of people bring their own stuff <laughs> they want you to sign. So they bring posters or they bring books or they bring uh Whatever. I was never asked to sign a body part or anything like that. But uh, so I don't know that I have a wild answer for you for that one. But um, but it is interesting to me. Yeah, they have they had all their DVD sets and they want got signatures from the entire cast and they, I mean, the amount of money that these fans spend at these conventions yeah. is just crazy, it's wild. You know, I, you have a, a few other films here that I do want to touch on. Um, you know, you were in the uh, the Invisible Kid. Uh, what was your? Yeah. Exp- yeah, tell me about that. Um, you know, <laughs> it too was not a great film, but I was proud of how I got the part. Okay. Um, it was a teen comedy, and uh, I played uh, the bad guy in the film, uh, kind of a dapper 
guy. He, as it was originally written, it was written as a New York Italian mafia kind of thug, and uh, I didn't. I do dialect, but I didn't do a New York accent at that time. So the director was also the writer, and I just decided when I went in for the audition. I'm going to go for broke and just do something I can do well rather than trying to fit into this New York gangster, which I didn't think I'd get cast in. And so I said, listen, I know it's not written like this, but what do you think about making your uh, your bad guy here a Southern guy? And I, I came dressed in a, uh, a three-piece off-white suit. I looked very uh, dapper. I wore sunglasses. And and I he said, well... Uh, Go ahead and read it like that. We'll let you read it that way. And so um, I did. And he said to me after he goes, I, you know, I, I don't know where you are, uh, where where that accent comes from in the South, because I am a Southerner and I don't know. <laughs> but I kind of liked it. <laughs> so I got the part doing that role the way I wanted to do it. And uh, that was pretty fun. There were some, you know, semi famous people in that. Film. Um, uh, Wallace Lankham, who played the uh, uh, the uh, lab technician in the original CSI for years and years and years, uh, was in it. Uh, Karen Black, who was in Five Easy Pieces with Jack Nicholson, mm-hmm. was in it. And uh, also China Phillips from the rock group Wilson Phillips was in it. And Wilson Phillips was not a group back then. Uh, when she, we were shooting our film, she would be late sometimes to the set because she said she was working uh, out uh, with her band. And, I, and I'm and i thinking, oh, you know, whatever. And then literally a year after our film, uh, Wilson Phillips breaks onto the American scene and had a hit number one for the last <laughs> there for about a year. So uh, those were the famous people. But it was just a fun little project uh, you know, not not quite as big as the role in Friday Thirteenth, but still fun to do. What about the first Power, which you did, of course, with Lou Diamond Phillips? My story about that that was again a very small role, uh, and I knew the director, so that's how I got the. In fact, I'm trying to think. I don't even think I necessarily auditioned for that role. I was just I had done him a favor in a, a previous. Thing he was involved with, and he uh, just gave me that part. But <clears throat> anyway, I sh- show up to the set, and uh, I go to the craft table to grab a coffee, and uh, Lou Diamond Phillips walks up to me, and he goes, hi, I'm Lou Diamond Phillips, and I'm thinking in my head, yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> I'm sure you don't know who I am. <laughs> uh, but he said, listen, I'm sorry we don't have any scenes together, but I just want to welcome you to the set, and I hope you have a fun time today. Yeah, that's and nice. I thought, I thought that was pretty classy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I heard that you know, we just lost Roger Moore, and I, I heard that he was like that as well. Um, would always come over and meet the behind the scenes people, you know. When, when did Roger Moore pass? <laughs> Roger Moore just passed away uh, um, about a month ago. I guess I missed that. Oh, I did you really? Lost. Yeah, I missed that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Can't, can't catch everything. So, yeah. No, um, but I, I, I've interviewed a couple of people that had worked with him, and uh, their their stories about him were very pleasant. He was very down to earth. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't stay away from people. He he was willing to you know mingle with uh, crew people and people like that. So, well, here's what I will tell you: if you're if if you're a young aspiring actor and you're lucky enough to get cast in any film, (laughs) Mm -hmm. be very, very, very kind to the crew because they can help you and they can not help you. (laughs) (laughs) And do it not because of that. Do it because it's the right thing to do, to be nice to people. (laughs) But but that said, uh, yeah, can you imagine if you think you're so full of yourself as an actor and you treat a sound guy badly and then you do the best, scene you've ever done in your life and the sound guy goes yeah we didn't get it sorry you're gonna have to do another one (laughs) so uh, so you want to be nice to people that can affect your how you look in a film yeah one last film i have listed here is called genuine risk 
genuine risk. Yeah. Um, again, another small part mm -hmm. uh, movie with Terrence Stamp. Yeah. Uh, and written by or directed by. I'm going to blow this. We get uh, a pretty well-known guy, and I can't blank it <laughs> on it. But uh, you know, the film uh, was okay. It was a you know kind of a. I recall a detective thriller kind of movie. Um, I had such a small part. It was just fun to do <laughs> to be on it. But, yeah, I, uh, I, I don't really uh, have any, any strong memories one way or the other about that film. Well, do you got like a, a web page or anything like that where people can check up uh, what you're doing and places where they can get autographs and whatnot? You know, uh, really, I don't. Um, I know because I, I really, I'm, I'm still working. I'm a, I'm a working man, so I, I uh, have to uh, really attend to that. But that's why I don't really do a ton of conventions and uh, uh, so forth. And I really have never created. I, I didn't do this when I was doing comedy a lot too. And of course, people ask the same thing. Well, what, what when can we know when you're going to be doing a, a gig? And uh, You'll just have to get lucky, I guess. So I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, you know I, I'm up for doing more conventions, but I just uh, don't get asked a lot. And any time I do, it's usually uh, because I hear about a convention that uh, that uh, Larry's going to and that there might be an uh, opportunity for me to join in or something like that. But uh, I wish I could say to your sports fans, <laughs> check in at this page, but I really don't have one. So. Any place where peop people, like, uh, how do they go about, like, getting an autograph or anything like that? Man, they just got to get lucky. No, listen, I'm on Facebook. If they <laughs> want to reach out to me that way, they can. Okay. Well, is there anything else? I know you just uh, came off um, a surgery. I hope you recover. I, I um I hope you're feeling better. I've only had one surgery in my life, and that was for uh, a rupture. <laughs> and I wouldn't have known about it, except my father had the same operation. When he told me about it, I was like, I got that kind of same condition. And, of course, I went to the doctor and found out, like, father, like son. <laughs> well, yeah, I um, I don't know what caused this back injury. I, I played sports all my life. I've played tennis since I was 10, and uh, so I've had a few surgeries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was perhaps the more, most the toughest one but uh, yeah, I'll make it I'll make it past here I I just still got more physical therapy to do but uh, I'll be back playing sports before too long so I understand Scotty McCoy reached out to you and um, I gotta say uh, he's a good guy he uh, uh, wrote the, of course the ultimate Friday the 13th trivia book <laughs> <laughs> well, is that what it's called, the ultimate? Yeah, book? I, actually, okay. I actually have it. <laughs> okay, the reason I ask is uh, this is something that a lot of people uh, ascribe to their efforts is the ultimate, yeah. this, the ultimate chart. <laughs> so, I don't know if there can be a 50 ultimate books on something, but uh, <laughs> I guess there can be. Anyway, yeah, I, I uh, did get contacted by Scotty, so we'll see what comes uh, from that. Well, I had Scotty on my show back in January, and he's uh, asked me about various people in horror films, about what they were like, and this and that, and wanted to know my connections, and I told him how I went about making some contacts, either by Facebook or, or where, however it is I did it, web pages, and uh, so, yeah, he's a good guy, you'll like talking to him. I never, ever, ever in my life seen somebody that smiles at their job as much as he does. He did, what is it, some kind of, com I believe it's some kind of computer job, but I'm like, jeepers, I don't smile at my job. I just want to go back to bed. <laughs> so. Well, that's good to hear. I, I, yeah, I didn't, I don't really know Scotty from uh, anything, but yeah, I'm happy to talk to him. Well, you'll, it'll be a pleasant experience for you. I, I can tell you that. Well, Dave. Yeah. Well, David, we're coming down to the end of our time here, and um, I, I want to say thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your memories of Chuck and Friday the Thirteenth Part Three and uh, the little meeting with uh, Tommy Chong. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, I, I appreciate uh, you accepting my request to do this. Um, it's it's an absolute honor and pleasure. Like, uh, I saw F- Friday the 13th Part 3. Um, I would have been 10 years old when that came out in 1982. Um, I didn't see it then, but I saw it probably shortly after. And so I, I feel like I've been familiar with you for the most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> makes me feel really old. No, listen, I'm happy to, to have a, this talk with you, and I hope that uh, your, your listeners enjoyed it, and uh, um, and I hope that you have enjoy much more success as the years go on. Well, you know, we'll be on, in touch on Facebook. Uh, I was going to say, uh, before you go, uh, I was wondering if you would do a plug for my show. Uh, sure. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't know that I took in the whole name of it when you said it at the beginning. So uh. okay, my my show's called Python's Paradise. Python like the snake because that's my DJ name. Okay. Yeah, and my name of course is Craig Gilbert. So just say say who you are that you're Chuck from Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, and say you're listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert. And if you can remember it, say out of New Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> Well, hold on. i got to write this down. I won't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting closer. Python, Bird, Gilbert. Okay, I got most of that. Yeah, out of New Brunswick, Canada. Yeah, got it. Okay, so uh, how do we do this? Well, uh, I just, just say... say it now? Yeah, go ahead. You okay. can do it now. Hey, folks, this is David Kadams. I played Chuck in... Friday the 13th, Part 3, I was the iconic pot smoker, and you, you're, um, I've been talking with uh, Greg Gilbert from Python's Paradise, recorded in New Brunswick, Canada. Please give a listen. Absolutely. And I hope to get more people from Part 3 to come on here, you know? Help you, you paved the way. You braved the waters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fool I. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on here, and I, I, I wish you a quick recovery, and, um, you know, I, I, I wish you the best. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Greg. You too. Take yes, care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.